Hey everyone, welcome back to Couch Potatoes, the show that brings history and pop culture together because someone's got to do it. <laughs> Remember those films that gave us nightmares when we were kids? If you were a child of the 70s like me, you might recall a tale of a shark terrorizing the waters of a small town. That film had it all. Passion, romance, uh, man against nature, man against beast, man against man. That's right. On today's episode, we're looking at Jaws, the true story behind the classic film. In 1975, a little movie about a shark gave kids another reason to hate bath time or to go anywhere near the water. It raked in millions at the box office, spun a number of sequels, and became one of the most unforgettable films of the 70s. Like so many motion pictures, it's a story ripped from the headlines. In 1916, Beach Haven, New Jersey prepared for its 4th of July celebration. It promised to be just a thing for Americans hoping to cast aside their fears of their husbands and sons being whisked away to fight for their lives in World War I, affectionately known as the War to End All Wars. And yet, just over the horizon was World War II, the war to end that theory. Charles Van Sant wandered out of his beachfront resort and into the sweltering heat. He wanted to take a dip into the Atlantic Ocean, letting the cool waters wash over him just before dinner time. Van Sant dove beneath the waves, swimming further and further from shore. His head emerged from the shallow surf, just in time to spot a dark figure cutting through the water. From the corner of his eye, he thought it must be a dolphin, but the creature veered closer, chomping down on the tiny frame of the 25-year-old. Van Zandt let out a horrible scream as the ocean waters turned red from the blood pouring out of his leg. Swimmers nearby could hear his cries of agony. They rushed to the young man's aid, forming a human chain in the hopes of pulling him to safety. Yet the creature, a shark, had too strong of a grip and refused to let go. Not until it came so close to shore that its underside scraped the pebbles on land did the shark give up and make a hasty retreat. Fellow vacationers scooped the badly bruised and bleeding Van Zant out of the water, carrying him into the Ingleside Resort. There, on the lobby's brightly colored carpet, he took his last breath. The resort's doctor later confirmed that the cause of death had been severe blood loss. Americans love the beach, the surf, but the idea of a shark attack along the New Jersey coast was unthinkable. I mean, stories like this was the reason Robert Ripley got up in the morning. <laughs> in the early 1900s, sharks were thought to be shy and timid, certainly no concern to the beach-going public. At least, that was the headline spread across newspapers after the attack. It was a one-in-a-million kind of thing, they said. Or perhaps the shark's true intent was a dog that swam near the victim. One thing was clear. Van Sant was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Not even a week went by before the unthinkable happened again. Charles Bruder splashed in the waters of Spring Lake a town about an hour's drive from Beach Haven. It was almost noon, lunchtime, when the 27-year-old bellhop went for a swim. It was peaceful, quiet. Bruder always liked the quiet. Most guests of the Essex and Sussex Motel were busying themselves preparing for the midday feast. From out of nowhere, a pointy nose and razor-sharp teeth leapt out of the water grabbing the employee by both legs, severing them at the knees. It was an awful sight. Vacationers gathered around emergency personnel as they drug him back to the safety of the sandy beach, but nothing could be done to save the young man's life. Onlookers who hadn't witnessed even a moment of the attack swore that the guilty party must have been a killer whale or maybe even a sea turtle anything but the obvious. Like it or not, it was time to act. 
Protective netting was strung up along the beaches of the New Jersey shore as teams of armed men took to the ocean. These brutal attacks had to end, and the sooner the better. It was July 12th as rays of sunlight rained down on Lester Stillwell. It was a hot day, nearly a hundred degrees. The 11-year-old and his young friends had been given a day's respite from the basket weaving factory where they worked. It was the perfect time to visit their favorite swimming hole along Matawan Creek. Lester frolicked in the waters, laughing, joking, and practicing his backstroke. The boys spoke of heading down to the local candy store. Sometimes the owner gave out free samples, counting on those yummy treats to lure them back after they'd earned a penny or two. With all the chatter, the splashing, no one saw the shadow ripping through the water until it was too late. A shark bit down on Stillwell's stomach, flipping him over, pulling the young child beneath the waves. In seconds, he surfaced, letting out a frightening scream before being pulled under again. His friends swam back to shore in a panic, their arms and legs slapping against the cool water. But Lester? He was nowhere to be seen. They ran so fast, it took but a moment to reach Matawan's main street where the group yelled for anyone nearby to help them. The clock ticked as a handful of townsfolk gathered their canoes, dashed to the scene, and pushed away from the shore. 24-year-old Stanley Fisher, a tailor, was among them. With wooden sticks and prying eyes, these folks probed the water for signs of Stillwell, but there was nothing at first. Fisher spots Lester and gives a shout to the others. With a burst of adrenaline, he dove from the rowboat into the creek. The local tailor was just about to wrap his arms around the young boy's lifeless body when a shark leaped from the water, sinking his teeth into Fisher's right leg. Bloodied from the attack, he and the body of Steelwell were dragged to the shore. Fisher's wounds were tended to, but it wasn't successful. His name added to the loss of life. Newspapers would credit one more attack to the man-eater. It's said that 12-year-old Joseph Dunn lost his leg near Matawan Creek. This time, things were different. Thankfully, he lived to tell his story. As for the killer from the sea, well, according to folks in the neighborhood, this meant war. The shark had a hundred dollar bounty put on its head. The reward was promised to anyone with proof of ending the terror it had brought forth. As news spread, a bloodthirsty mob descended upon the creek. Their spears and pitchforks were on a mission. But the shark hunters had come prepared, arming themselves with much more than that. It's unknown just how many bullets were fired into the water that day. And when ammunition ran out, the men reached for sticks of dynamite. This had become personal. Stacks of letters arrived at the White House in Washington, D.C. They came not just from New Jersey, but from all over the country, urging the American president to take decisive action against further attacks. Woodrow Wilson was quick to oblige. He held an emergency cabinet meeting aimed at ending what he called the shark horror. A number of ideas were thrown on the table, such as tasking the U.S. Coast Guard to render those man-eaters extinct. However, nothing was ever enacted. That morning, as the government deliberated, and I know I'm going to butcher this name, <laughs> local fisherman Michael Slicer spotted a dark fin wildly bobbing back and forth in the netting he'd cast in Raritan Bay. Wow, it's real windy outside. I'm not sure if you all can hear that. I'll have to check things later. <laughs> but anyway, he grabbed an oar, whacking a large fish atop the head repeatedly until it stopped moving. It didn't take long to realize that that fish was a shark. 
As soon as his boat reached land, Slicer took a pocket knife that he'd always kept on hand and gutted the terror from the deep. Rumor has it that human bones fell out, but that was never proven. No one knows whether or not that was the same shark that had brought a tragic end to so many lives. What we do know is that no other attacks occurred in New Jersey that summer. It stopped as quickly as it began. What we also know is that all was never forgiven. The relationship between humans and sharks was tainted and never fully recovered since that terrible footnote of 1916. During his interview in the New York Times in 1975, author Peter Benchley swore that there's absolutely no way that the events in New Jersey where a shark attacks a group of young people in a small town was ever the inspiration for his novel Jaws. I'm not sure I believe it. Benchley's novel was adapted to become a major motion picture and terrified scores of moviegoers, including me. <laughs> Thanks for watching Couch Potatoes, the show that brings history and pop culture together because someone's gotta do it. <laughs> if you've enjoyed the episode, do me a favor. Comment, subscribe, and be sure to ring the bell so you'll always be notified of further installments. I'm Erickson Steele reminding you to always look both ways before getting into the bathtub. You never know what's in those waters. <laughs> See ya!